In this reading, Jesus gives thanks for the humble people who were led to follow him and invites all those burdened by religious rules to find their rest in him. At that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and have revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this was your good pleasure. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. This is the word of the Lord. I invite you all to be seated. There are so many reasons to be weary. <laughs> there is the daily dose of bad news from whatever our particular news stream is. There are politicians endlessly attacking each other and working to raise our anxiety so that we'll turn to them, kind of manipulating us. And then there are the ads. You know, the ads that inform us about something we didn't even know existed, but we desperately need. And of course, if you're on social media, there's the weariness of friends who are constantly posting, on the one hand, how great their life is, so your life kind of doesn't seem that great in comparison, or posting about everything terrible that's happening, and you wish you could do something to help them, and you feel helpless. And that's not to mention our own stuff, right? Our own burdens, our, our own illnesses, our own relationship struggles, uh, our own uh, issues with aging or whatever it may be. There's all these reasons to be weary. And I'm not talking about physically weary, although aging and the combination of summer activities could leave you physically weary. But I'm talking about soul weary. I'm talking about weary in your heart. And the good news that Jesus announces to us is that we can come to him for renewing rest, rest for our souls. And we say, well, how does that work? Well, I want to draw out a couple of things from Jesus' words here that I think help us in this respect. And the first is that we find rest in Jesus' presence. Notice he says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Not to teachers of the law, not to a particular building or location, but come to Jesus. Now in Jesus' day, people were desperate to know God. They were desperate to have uh, assurance that, that they were okay with God and that they would receive eternal life. And for them, religion was a burden. It was all about rules and regulations, about, about everything, right? Even the smallest details of their lives, the religious teachers had made up rules about. So in the Bible, when it talks about a Sabbath day walk, there were so many steps you could take on the Sabbath day, and after that, you were doing work. So you had to stay within a Sabbath day walk. To this day, in a communities like in New Jersey or New York City, where you have large Orthodox communities, in some buildings on the Sabbath day, on Saturday, the elevator stops at every store, every floor. You know why? Because the rabbis say it's work to push the button for your floor. So the elevator stops at every floor. And this is the human impulse, right? To make up rules about how to obey God. We, we call it legalism, and we're all prone to it, to make up rules that suit us, that are easy for us to lift, and impossible for other people to lift, so that we can assure ourselves that we're in and they're out. So Jesus says to the Jewish teachers and the, the Pharisees, he said, you tie up heavy loads and put them on men's shoulders, but are not willing to help move them. And many people can't help but see religion today as that, as something that ties up heavy loads. And you're a hypocrite if you proclaim yourself being able to obey all these rules. 
Okay? Because nobody can obey all those rules, at least not perfectly, not good enough to say they have fellowship with a holy God. But here's the good news. The good news of Christianity is that Jesus didn't come to give us more rules. He came to fulfill the law for us. That is to take our place. And you know, a lot of times we say, well, Jesus came to die for us. Well, that's partly right. But he came to live for us. He came to live an entirely righteous life. And I don't mean righteous just by the rules either. Jesus pointed out that, you know, you can say, well, I've never committed murder. And boy, have I heard people say that. It's not like I killed anybody. But Jesus says, if you're so much as angry in your heart against your brother, you've already committed murder in your heart. If you so much as look at a woman lustfully, he says, then you've already committed adultery in your heart. And it's like, well, by that standard, who can keep God's law? Which is exactly what Jesus' point is. At the end of that sermon, we call it the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, be perfect the way your Father in Heaven is perfect. And boy, if I ended a sermon that way, you wouldn't be back next week, would you? But Jesus proclaimed that because the purpose of the law was not so that we could have a little, a little sheet of comparison one to each other. The purpose of the law was to show us that none of us, none of us can obey God's law and that he himself would send someone to do it for us. Some of you know when I was uh, working my way through college during the summers, I had a great job. Not great because the conditions were great, great because it was the most money I could possibly make as a college student. And that was um, working for a paper mill. I started out as groundskeeper, and when I turned 18, I could work doing heavy construction and demolition, and because of that, I got to drive a lot of cool machines. However, at this particular mill, most of those machines were really old. In fact, I remember there was a boom crane that dated back to the 1920s somewhere. It had no paint left on it, no glass in the windshield, no leather on the seats. You sat on springs, right? <laughs> and as a result of that, very often we broke the equipment. So often that when the, whenever the mechanic would see me, he'd just smile and look at me and say, what did you break now? <laughs> and uh, one time it was, the, uh, it was the tractor that we mowed the lawns with that the steering broke and I went downhill into a pile of trees and couldn't get out. <laughs> Another time it was that boom crane, which because it had no paint or stickers left on it, I didn't realize was the only major machine uh, that the company owned that didn't run on diesel. So I put 55 gallons of diesel in it, got about 100 yards, <laughs> and it made a lot of noise. That was the worst of the, what did you break this time? But here's the thing. He always said it with a smile. And within a couple of hours to a couple of days, that machine was back up and running. I mean, it was amazing. And it, and it was amazing to have someone to turn to who could fix what there's no way I could fix. I could just make worse. And that is what Jesus came to do. He came to be our fixer, to fix with us this issue between us and a righteous God who is the judge of the universe, right? I mean, at one point, Jesus says to a guy, who appointed me to judge? And the answer is God, right? That's not where he was going with that. But the reality is, you know, my kids say to me all the time, don't judge, right? But there's a certain extent where you earn the right to judge other people but not to the extent God does. We never are in the place of God. We never are able to judge people's salvation. But God does. He has to because he's a holy God. He has to be not just all loving. He has to also be all just because to be unjust is not loving. So Jesus came to be both for us, to show us God's love and to fulfill the righteousness of God on our behalf so that all of us, no matter where we've been, can understand and know for a certainty that God accepts us, that he loves us, that we belong to him. How many of you are able to sleep on airplanes? Raise your hand if you can sleep on airplanes. I gotta tell you, I have trouble sleeping in cars because uh, I know how to drive a car. <laughs> And it kind of depends on who I'm riding with. It's a sign of great trust and respect if I'm able to sleep while you're driving. Because I may be able to do something. I may see something coming, or I may catch the other person falling asleep. But on a jetliner, now nah, they, they have the cockpit sealed off. I mean, I might as well just take a nap, right? Because my fate is totally in the hands of the pilot, 
He's had years of training. He knows way better than I do. There's nothing I can do about it. I might as well just relax and trust. And it's a calling. As Christians, sometimes we get so uptight and we're so tempted by the things that, that people tell us in order to manipulate us through anger, to get us upset, so that we won't trust God, so that we'll try to take things into our own hands. But God sent Jesus to be our fixer. And we continually remind ourselves of that, that we can come to him when we're weary and burdened for rest. And we find this not only in Christ's presence, but in the gentleness of Jesus' personality. Jesus says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. And when you read through the Gospels, you find that gentleness, with the exception of Jesus' condemnation for the religious authorities who are misrepresenting him. But for people who are hurting, for people who don't feel they're good enough, Jesus is kindness. You know, there's a, there's a legend regarding this, this yoke because we know that Joseph, Jesus' father, was a carpenter. A, a tecton is the Greek word. It, it really means contractor by our terms. They could do all sorts of different things. But there's a legend from the early church uh, that what Joseph specialized in was hand carving yokes. Because there was no mass production. Each yoke was hand carved to perfectly fit the back of the animal so that there would be no chafing so that it would not be too heavy or not be too weak, so that it would enable the animal to do what it could not otherwise do. And this is what Jesus means when he says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He's not going to call us to do things that are contrary to the essential nature of who we are. He's instead crafting a life for us that's a perfect fit. Not a perfect fit for what other people necessarily tell us we should be or how we should behave, but a perfect fit for who God created us to be. And we find confidence to be gentle in that. During the uh, pandemic, my kids and I rediscovered uh, a, a childhood hero of mine, which was also a hero of them. And we're not talking Superman or Batman or any of those violent vigilantes. We're talking Mr. Rogers. Mr. Rogers. I happened to hear an interview with Mr. Rogers. He was still uh, alive at the time. And, uh, and the interviewer asked him where he got his approach to children, because it was pretty countercultural when he started in the 1960s to speak kindly to children, to listen to them as if they had something important to say, to be gentle with them, to be positive and uplift them, to talk to them about difficult subjects but with confidence and, and kindness. And the answer was he learned it from his grandfather. When he would go to his grandfather's farm, his grandfather always had time for him, always spent time listening to him, treating him like he was the most important person in the world. Uh, by the way, that grandfather was his grandfather, McFeely. If, if you know Mr. Rogers' neighborhood, you know the delivery man's name was Speedy McFeely, named after Mr. Rogers' grandfather. You know, there's another place that Mr. Rogers also learned about this strength to be gentle and this caring for people enough to listen. Because actually, his other title was not Mr. Rogers, it was Reverend Rogers. I don't know if you know, he was, he was an ordained Presbyterian minister whose special calling was to minister to children through this television program. He, he knew Jesus, and it comes out in his gentleness, in his confidence, even when he was struggling with serious illnesses, even when he was struggling with, with anger himself. He could tell children, everybody gets angry. It's okay. But you have choices as to what to do with your anger. In fact, I think my favorite Mr. Rogers song was, What Do You Do With The Mad That You Feel? He understood that we have choices because we have a God who's given us choices. Because Jesus modeled for us the gentleness of God. If, if you only have, I get it, the Old Testament, especially if you only read certain parts, you're going to misunderstand God. Because he's struggling with the children of Israel to get them to be an exemplary nation, to draw all nations away from things like child sacrifice and, and, and to the God who values every life. And the children of Israel disobey again and again and again. 
So God sends Jesus, the fulfillment of the Jewish law, to reveal his personality in a way that we wouldn't understand through just words. We had to have actions as well. And this is another place that we find the assurance that we can go to him for rest, and that is in the, the grace of Jesus' plan. The grace, the fact that it's not a plan to impose more rules upon us. It's not a plan to force us into subjection. Jesus says, you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He's talking about faith. He's talking about trusting that it's been done for us through him. Sometimes that's hard. You know, theologians talk about the now and the not yet. The now is what we have here and now because of Jesus. So we have the beauty of nature and the sound of traffic. We have assurance that we're acceptable to God through Jesus, and yet we still struggle with illness. We still struggle with injustice in the world. We still struggle with pain of all kinds because we don't yet live in the not yet. The not yet are the things that have been paid for, but we haven't received yet. Okay? And what we haven't received is a new heaven, a new earth, a new bodies that don't decay, and new relationships with each other and with God. And we haven't received them, Peter says, because not because God is slow in keeping his promises, but because he's patient with us. He doesn't want anyone to perish. He wants all people to come to a knowledge of him. That's why we're still around. There will come a day where God will call it quits. But it hasn't come yet. And this is part of the grace of God's plan. Even the pain we suffer is ultimately because of, in God's grace, he's not ready to, keep, to end the world. Right? To end the world. And it's kind of like people saying, well, I could tell you, but I'd have to kill you. God has a plan. We don't fully understand it yet. We're confident that we will when we die. Right now, we don't. But here's the thing. We can trust the person. Even if we don't fully understand the plan, we can trust that God has a plan. You know, when I was in college, I took a class on apocalyptic literature. Uh, many people don't know this. There were a bunch of writings called apocalypses that were written from about mm, 200 years before Jesus to about 100 years afterwards. And they were these visions, these highly symbolic visions of how the world was going to end and the enemies of God's people were going to get what was coming to them. And the most famous one, of course, is the Revelation, the, the last book in Scripture, which is hard for us because we haven't studied apocalyptic literature, and, and you kind of got to understand how symbols are used throughout the Scripture to, to understand it. But here's the reason it was included in the Bible by the early church. It was included because there are some significant differences between this apocalyptic writing and all the other ones. And to me, the most significant difference is this. All the other ones end with, God judges the world and all our enemies die. The end. That's it. That's the end of most apocalyptic writings. But that's not the way the revelation ends, is it? I mean, have you looked in the back of the book? God wins. Okay? In the end, there's a new heaven and a new earth and a new relationship between God and his people. And nature itself is restored to the way that it was meant to be, including our human nature including our bodies, and there's no more sorrow, no more crying, no more pain, no more evil. That's God's plan. And they may not consciously understand this, but there's a way in which small children understand this better than I do, better than you do. And that is, they have a sense that they have caregivers, or at least they ought to, who know more than they do, whom they can trust, to take care of their problems, to be their fixer. And that's part of the reason I think that children can sleep better than they can. Because trust comes more naturally when you're a child. You don't really have a choice. But you and I are the children of God. We're called to have that trust. We're called to rest our spirits, to relax. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>